this great deployment of the American economy in all its productive capacity is how, in World War II, America outproduced its enemies. In the 1930s, the country is still sunk in the Great Depression. So while America was still the world's largest economy, huge segments of it were more or less lying fallow, we might say. The United States, United Kingdom, and France had not come back after World War I in anything like the robust way that the authoritarian regimes did by militarizing their economies. Nazis were spending millions, arming Germany to the teeth. And America had a pitifully small army and not much bigger of a navy and almost no air force to speak of. By the time we get to 1940, something was brewing and something was coming. America is not yet at war, but the Nazis definitely are. Hitler in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, the militarist faction in Tokyo. But at the same time, a large chunk of the American population was isolationist. They wanted no part of a war. They thought we could simply look inward and look to those oceans to keep us out of any conflict. It is serious enough to live in a world torn by wars on other continents. It is our national duty to keep those wars out of the Americas. And then Germany won this dramatic military campaign in France, driving the British off the continent. Hitler was looking across the English Channel and already launching his bombers against England. But Britain was running out of war material. They needed tanks, bombers, and guns to keep fighting. FDR realized if Britain was to be resupplied and to keep Britain in the game, America would solely be the, the economy that could do that. The question, though, was mobilization. We had a lot of idle capacity in our factories, in our capital, in our labor supply. It needed to be called into action. The people of Europe who are defending themselves do not ask us to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, planes, the tanks, the guns. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. It was a, a total change in demand for what the industrial economy here needed to be producing. FDR tells Congress we need to increase production to more than 50,000 planes per year. And Hermann Goering, one of the Germans' military leaders, is purported to have said, oh, the Americans, they're good at razor blades and washing machines. We don't need to worry. But, of course, he misses the point. I think it's safe to say that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was not the candidate of big business. But he calls Big Bill Newsom from General Motors, who was a genius for the vast production that Ford was able to achieve, the assembly line and all those kinds of things. Newsom stood up and said, yes, sir, what can I do? FDR said, need your help. How do we do this, and will you lead it? Bill Knudsen gave up his salary, came to Washington, went to his hotel room and mapped out for FDR in a couple of days a plan that he thought in 18 months would turn the industrial capacity of the country into this amazing machine that could support Britain to keep them in the fight. Knudsen realized that there were a lot of profound changes required. He tells FDR that you've really got to change your procurement policies for us to get on with it. And if you can do that, we will get on with it. He had such rapport with the titans of industry that he could call people, convincing them that there was a broader national cause to put people back to work and to put the productive capacity at its highest level. And in America, the only way we were going to do that is let business be business and let producers produce. Conversion from peacetime work to total war production goes at top speed. Yesterday, this was an underwear factory. Today, it turns out cloth for gas masks. If you could make silk evening dresses, you could make parachutes. People who are making typewriters all of a sudden making rifles. People who made refrigerators. You know how to bend sheet metal, you can make airplanes now. Ford ends up producing B-24s. And of course, in December 1941, the debate about whether America would involve itself in World War II suddenly became moot. But we had already done 18 months of hardcore work on retooling the economy, and that meant we were 
prepared to gear up to very rapid production in 1942. That was when businessmen realized that in terms of the raw numbers, the integrated, justly paid workforce was absolutely essential to the building of the arsenal of democracy. So alongside millions of women who entered the industrial workforce were African Americans in great numbers. By 1943 and 1944, the U.S. is operating at peak production. It's the biggest industrial program in the world. Perhaps the best example is shipbuilding. It used to take months, but the Kaiser construction firm out west actually built a Liberty ship in five days. The enemy didn't count this ability to change among our secret weapons. It's another example of what the sheer strength and capacity of a free market economy put to a purpose can accomplish. The free market was absolutely essential to the building of the arsenal of democracy, and given the fact that we were fighting Hitler to the benefit of the entire world.